Hello and welcome back to Dr. Logic Awkwardly Does Logic in Her Office. I've got one more semantic notion to talk to you about today before we move on from things like tautologies and contradictions and consistencies. This is going to be a notion that involves not one sentence, but two. And it is the notion of semantic equivalence. So as I said, most of the sentences that you look at are going to sometimes be true and sometimes be false. They are neither tautologies nor contradictions. However, there are going to be many pairs of sentences where even though they are kind of merely consistent, sometimes true, sometimes false, they will always have the same truth value as some other sentence. When this happens, when if you look at the column underneath the main connective on the truth table, it's always exactly the same for every single row, even if sometimes it's true and sometimes it's false, so long as the values match, then we will have the notion of semantic equivalence. So sometimes we will say that sentences that are semantically equivalent are also logically equivalent. Now, this is a little bit slippery because logical equivalence can also mean we can prove that they are equivalent in our logical system. Any language where your proof theory is adequate for your semantics, semantic equivalence and provable equivalence are gonna coincide. And so it doesn't matter which one we call logical equivalence. But I want to kind of keep, keep our focus here on the semantic level. Equivalence is a notion of truth. And one of the consequences of two sentences being semantically equivalent is that if you make a biconditional between them, so this is essentially shorthand for the conjunction of, the, of two conditionals, then uh, the result of that will be a tautology. So let me just go through some of those uh, ideas in a little bit more detail. First of all, I just realized that I haven't actually taught you the biconditional. So the biconditional is, well, it's something that we could have added to our logical language as a primitive notion, but, it's, but we can also just introduce this symbol, this double-headed arrow as a shorthand. So when we write P double-headed arrow Q, this is to be taken as shorthand for P implies Q and Q implies P. So why is it called a biconditional? Because it is a conjunction of two conditionals. So the way that you can read this is P if and only if Q. I believe I've introduced that abbreviation, the IFF for if and only if before. But anyway, there you go. So now we can give our definition of semantic equivalence. So two well-formed formulas, phi and psi, are semantically equivalent. So that's the notion we're defining, semantic equivalence if they always have the same truth value. So, as each other. It may not always be the case that they're always true or always false, but they will always match up with each other. So one thing to, to note from this is that every tautology is semantically equivalent to every other tautology, and every contradiction is semantically equivalent to every other contradiction. But this, they're kind of like the, the, you know, the edge cases. We're interested in what's going on in the middle. So one thing to note, so this is just a brief corollary. So a consequence of the definitions that basically falls out immediately, if phi and psi are semantically equivalent, then the biconditional between the two of them will be a tautology. And just think about it. So the biconditional is a shorthand for two conditionals. A condi if both the antecedent and the consequence of a conditional are true, the conditional is true. If both of them are false, the conditional is true. So as long as the antecedent and consequent of both conditionals always have the same truth value, then they will always be true. So the conjunction of them is always true. So there's no way that you would ever have a false, 
a falsity if you are uh, stating the biconditional between two semantically equivalent formulas. So there's just a very brief argument for this corollary. Now, we will also use this notion of semantic equivalence to simplify our notation a bit. So two lemmas, we have the associativity of conjunction, and we'll also have the associativity of disjunction. So what we will note is that essentially the order that you put conjunctions together doesn't make a difference. So if you have three sentences, phi one, phi two, and phi three, and you take the conjunction of the first two and then conjoin the third one, this is going to have the same truth value as, so if you first conjoin the second and third, and then conjoin on the first one. So these two formulas are semantically equivalent. And the reason this is called the associativity of conjunction is it, does, it, it it's, doesn't matter which of the conjuncts you associate together in what order, it doesn't affect the truth values. So we have a similar result. So the associativity of disjunction, and that just says that if you have three sentences, phi one, phi two, and phi three, and you disjoin the first two together and then disjoin that to the third, or if you first disjoin the, uh, just want to erase that. Um, if first you disjoin the second two, so phi two and phi three, and then you disjoin the first one to it, these are also semantically equivalent. Now, I'm not gonna actually give you the proof of this. What you would have to do to prove both of these is to just draw out the full truth table and check that they have the same truth value at every line of the table. So proof we can say is by inspection of the truth tables. So this is something that I will leave as an exercise for you if you really want to do it. But then we will use this fact to adopt a convention where we don't end up with ambiguity. So where ambiguity doesn't result, we can write, ooh, am I gonna have space here? Something like phi one and phi two and phi three. So three conjunctions within these parentheses or in the case of disjunctions, phi one or phi two or phi three. So essentially what I've done is we've dropped the internal brackets because it doesn't really matter which ones we take first. A as we learned from the Stoics, a conjunction is true if all of the conjuncts are true. And as we learn kind of in contradistinction to the Stoics, but remember our inclusive or, the disjunction is true if any one of them is true and it doesn't matter which order you take them. So there you go. One little bit more of semantic definitions and terminology and notation. The biconditional is something useful for kind of shorthand. We could always write the conjunction of the conditionals instead. And sometimes it's useful to do that. But sometimes it's easier to just say P if and only if Q. And also adopting this new convention of dropping the internal brackets if we have a string of conjunct or a string of disjuncts. So there you go. Next time, I think that we will probably talk about conjunctive normal form and disjunctive normal form, which are two exciting ways of rendering proposition, arbitrary prop propositional formulas in a setup that uh, kind of gives them a uniform structure. You can do really cool things with conjunctive normal form and disjunctive normal form kind of in future future logical development, but I'll tell you about it now simply because it deals a lot with semantic equivalences and so will allow us to kind of reinforce the concepts that I've just introduced you to in this video. So I look forward to seeing you then. Cheers! <laughs>